Hi guys, this is our uh, next segment and this is about the absolute age. This is pretty hard so I hope you will be able to follow it. If not, then just ask me questions in the lab. Um, so just a little bit about the history of the absolute age. First of all, we have to talk about Anthony Henry Baccarel. Baccarel. Uh, he lived between 1852 and 1908. Um, Baccarat actually inherited a, a bunch of minerals, um, among them uranium salts from his father. And he, he was the one, Baccarat, who realized that these salts were just different. Um, if he left them near a photographic plate, you know, like a long time ago, the way we used to process the, the pictures, especially before that, they actually used glass plates, which were sensitive to light. And when he placed this uranium salt on that uh, on that photo photographic glass, uh, and it he never opened the door or anything, so it supposedly didn't see lights, and then developed these these glasses. What he realized is that that actually um, they they have a property which looks like that the plates have seen lights. Um, even though they didn't. So when he processed the plates, they showed um, fogginess, which means the minerals have had some kind of radiation which made the plate behave like if it's in light before. Um, his, his, um, he realized that this had to be something in the uranium in this uranium salt, so the uranium atom, atom radiates something which behaves like light. So for this discovery uh, of the spontaneous radioactivity, Bakrav was actually uh, awarded half of the Nobel Prize in, in 1903. The other half went to uh, Madame Curie and Pierre Curie uh, for their study on the radiation. So now we're going to talk about uh, Maria Sklodowska Curie. Uh, Maria Sklodowska is her um, maiden name. She lived between 1867 and 1934. Um, and, you know, she was from Poland. And in Poland, and anywhere in the world, ladies could not go to the college at the time. So... Um, she was one of the first women who could go to, to college, actually, and she and her sister went to Sorbonne in France, and she finished her degree at Sorbonne, and soon after she met Pierre Curie, who was already a professor there of physics, I believe, I'm not sure, and um, she was looking for a graduate, um, you know, something to work on in graduate school, like a topic, a research topic, that's it. And uh, Pierre, uh, known Henry Becker out pretty good, and Henry was talking to Pierre about the, the uranium salt and their uh, interesting behavior. Uh, so, so Mary Curie have decided to work on, on radioactivity. Of course, she was a lady, so they didn't give her much uh, possibility at the Sorbonne. Basically, they gave her a, an old uh, airplane hangar, you know, where the airplanes used to park. So there was no heat, no water, running water, no electricity, nothing like that. And she worked with her two hands on this uranium saw. This is how the mineral looked like. They knew that it has some kind of radiation, but they just didn't understand how bad it is actually and um, how sick can you be from from radiation and she worked a huge amount of this uranium salts like like she started with like tons of them she had to actually uh, separate the uranium atom out of this uranium salts and this this actually shows you one of one piece of that uranium salt she worked with and this is her notes and actually her notes are in the sore bone and reserve. If you wanted to go and look at her notes, you have to sign a release form because they're still radiating so hard that actually you can get some kind of radiation out of them. So you have to sign a release form to do that. She's a very interesting lady, but they wouldn't have given her, even though she, she figured out the radioactivity, she named it. Um, 
and uh, she, f she actually discovered polonium. Polonium is another radioactive element and actually she named it after her country, uh, Poland. So polonium is named after Madame Curie's uh, home country, Poland, polonium, Poland. Uh, she was the first to use the term radioactivity. as I already kind of told you. And um, so she named this uh, radiation uh, radioactivity. She was the first woman in Europe who received uh, a PhD in science. And in 1903, she became the first woman to get a Nobel Prize. Of course, she didn't get it by herself. She shared it with her husband and Henry Becker Becquerel. But uh, actually later, I think 1912, she got another one that she got by herself. Um, the next slide is showing the hangar she worked in and that's her picture. Um, her husband died pretty soon because they were exposed to this radiation and so that have changed their bodies and um, actually he died in, a, in an accident like a, a you know, a, a horse-powered car, I don't remember the name of it, so I'm not even buggy. A buggy ran through him uh, when he was shopping for a late Christmas day for Christmas presents for uh, his family. He got run over by that buggy, and that's what killed him. People believe that they probably have had some problems from radiation. Anyhow, on the internet exercise, I did give you a whole lot of uh, reading about Madame Curie. I think she had, she really had a fascinating life, so it, it's good to know about. Okay, so now let's go into the more serious stuff. Remember, we talked about in physical geology that uh, the chemical elements are made up of atoms, and in their nucleus, there is protons and neutrons. If the number of protons are different, while the that's not right. Remember, this is not right. If the number of neutrons are different, the number of protons are always the same to be the same atom. But if the number of neutrons are different, while the atomic number, which is the number of protons, are the same, we call it isotope. So let's go back. Isotope is when the number of protons are the same, but the number of neutrons might change. Some of the very well-known isotopes are the oxygen isotopes. Oxygen has the 16 and 18. And remember, uh, we learned about this, and you could look up a, a periodic table. I cannot bring it up right now. Uh, if you look at the oxygen, the atomic number of the oxygen is 8. So that just means that every single oxygen atom has 8 protons in it. And uh, to make oxygen 16, to the 8 protons, you have to have 8 neutrons. So oxygen 16 nucleus will have 8 protons and 8 neutrons, which if you add up, is going to give you the mass number, and that is 16. That's why we call it oxygen 16. So that shows the mass number here, because the atomic number is always 8. Now, if you have the oxygen 18, and the atomic number is uh, 8, which means there is 8 proton, then what has to be the number of neutrons to get the mass number 18? That's right, it's 10. So which isotope is heavier, the 16 or the 18? You're right, the 18, because the 18 has two more neutrons. It's almost equal with the, with the weight of the proton, so if you have two more neutrons, then the the, atom, atom, the the oxygen 18 is heavier than the oxygen 16. The other really common isotopes which you know well is the carbon 12, 13, and of course the 14. The carbon 12 and 13 are so-called stable isotopes similarly to the oxygen. Uh, that means that if a carbon forms is 12, it's going to stay 12. If a carbon forms as 13, it's going to stay 13. With the carbon, the number of the protons are 6, so when you have carbon-12, that means 6 proton, 6 neutron. When you have carbon-13, it means 6 proton and 7 neutron. And when you got the carbon-14, that means it has 6 proton and 
eight neutrons. So the only difference between the isotopes is the number of the neutrons. Remember the number of protons have to be the same. Now some of these isotopes are called stable isotopes. When an isotope is stable that just means that when it formed as 12 it's going to stay 12 through time. When it formed 13 it's going to be 13 through time. It will never change into anything else. However when we're talking about carbon-14 Carbon-14 is a so-called radioactive isotope. That just means that through times, it will change into another element. So the number of uh, uh, protons or the electrons are changing. Uh, so that's radioactive or unstable isotope. If you have an element which has an unstable nuclei, we call it radioactive element. Also, we, can, we call them parent isotopes. These parent isotopes will undergo spontaneous change, we call it radioactive decay, until permanent stable configuration is reached. This could be a whole bunch of steps. It's not necessarily just one step. It could be a whole bunch. Uh, and the last step, which is the stable isotope, Every uh, radioactive isotope will go through uh, spontaneous decays until they reach a stable form, uh, an isotope which is, which is stable so it won't decay anymore. There is three types of emission. When you have a radioactive decay, that means a particle will come out of the nucleus and that's how it changes into another element. There are cases when it's not changing. Let me explain in a minute. Uh, so every single emission uh, for every single atom is going to have exactly the same uh, rate. It's very, very important and it's going to be very, very characteristic to any particular isotope. So let's start talking about this. This here is the so-called nuclear symbol. When you have nuclear symbol, that shows more than what you see in the, in the periodic table. Because it shows you the, the uh, symbol of the element, like this one is the helium. It shows the atomic number of the helium right here, it's two. So it has two protons always. And it also shows the mass number. So basically, the, these uh, nuclear symbols are ready to be used in the so-called nuclear equation, which is the showing the different emission of the radioactive elements. So... Nuclear symbols usually used in nuclear equation. So let's look at the, the first type of decay. The first type of decay is the alpha decay. When you have an alpha particle emitting from the nucleus of an element, the alpha particle is basically equal with the helium nucleus. The helium nucleus will have two protons, and two neutrons so therefore the mass number is going to be four and this is the nuclear symbol for the helium so this is how we will show alpha particle when an alpha particle emits from the elements nucleus in the nuclear equation we always have to write up the nu the, the nuclear uh, formula of the helium right here so here is an example of the 